he calls to the female encouragingly. She jumps in, perhaps to assess the situation. Superficially, these aren't the most lovable set of creatures you've perhaps ever covered. Do you think people are going to be surprised by some of the revelations that come out in filming? I hope so. I mean, I think I would, would like to think that people will find that just as interested as watching a cuddly bunny rabbit. They, um, because in, during the course of the filming, there are some pretty astonishing examples of tenderness even between some of the animals. There's the crocodile that blows bubbles and yep. the, the, the turtle that nuzzles another. I mean, was that yourself? Did you find that surprising that these, these hefty, perhaps what we would consider dangerous creatures could actually be so gentle and loving? Well, yes and no. Uh, I mean, the fact of the matter is that there are certain uh, episodes in, in an animal's life, including our own lives, which require certain certain characteristics. Um, I mean, many animals just leave their animal, their eggs, for example, and say goodbye to them. But it, many other animals actually look after their young, and there are many reptiles that do. And so it's not all that surprising. Out she comes, and mother and father embrace. In this series, did you did you find greater effects than perhaps you had done before of the, the, the man's effect on the environment, the explosion of population, climate change affecting the particular animals you were looking at? Much, almost almost less than most, because uh, the thing about one of the things about reptiles is that they can survive in areas where we simply don't want to go. They can survive in 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 the, the driest of deserts, uh, and we we don't intrude upon that. Uh, and they are so efficient at, at uh, the way they uh, you know, the way they hand their, get their energy demands um, that they um, can live on, you know, a snake can, can need, need only feed once every three months. So, so uh, they uh, are living in areas where by and large we don't intrude upon. After the rains have fallen, spadefoot toads all emerge together. They must feed and breed, if possible, before the sun rises. Do you, would you have the patience of, of the amazing camera team that you have um, to, to sit, such in the case with the snow? The cameramen have got that patience, not me. I mean, they're the ones who do it. It's all very well for me. I mean, I appear and everybody thinks I did the whole damn thing. I flew the aeroplane and you know, everything. <laughs> uh, and that I was there when every second was. But of course I'm not. Um, and on this program, on this series, I think about 18 cameramen. A dozen to 18. Well, you can't be a dozen to 18 cameramen, you know, simultaneously. Um, my job is to, is to uh, write the scripts initially. Um, and then with the producer, he will sort out which sequences are going to be filmed by whom. Uh, but the script will also include uh, very precisely where it's necessary for me to appear, or where it's not. Um, and then you go and shoot those. A toad that can live in as parts the desert as this is impressive evidence of the versatility of the amphibians. The way they can adapt their behavior and their anatomy to live so far away from water. With a, you have a spiny anteater named, uh, named after yeah. you. Ever been tempted to get hold of one of them, maybe, and just... Well, nobody, uh, no, unfortunately, we think it could be well be extinct. <laughs> uh, we don't know where it lives. Uh, certainly, the place where it was identified no longer lives. Uh, and there was a, uh, a team in the Folger Mountains in New Guinea uh, a year or so ago who found signs of an anteater that may well be Amber Eye. Uh, but um, we don't know, we haven't seen. What did you feel when you were informed that someone had, had taken oh, it upon themselves? Nice 